Okay, welcome. Thanks so much um, for everybody who could attend today. Uh, I know this is, this is a bonus. This is kind of like our session um, to talk about how we might be feeling um, right now at this point in our lives. So um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Leslyn Kantner. She is a licensed medical health counselor and the founder of Harmony Counseling Center. It's a private counseling practice in Southeast Pennsylvania. And uh, in addition to that, she works with high school students at the International Boarding School um, in, in, in the area. In 2018, Leslin developed the Elevate class, which is a personal growth training and coaching program that operates as a boot camp for self-awareness and discovery. She is co-founder and principal of the podcast, Try This at Home, broadcasting 40 episodes a year filled with ideas to make life better. In September of last year, she published her first book, Be Happier, Healthier, and More Productive, 365 Inspiring Ideas. And in her personal life, she loves to paint, cook, and spend time with family, particularly the newest member, her grandson. So welcome, Leslin. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us here today. And I know that you also uh, incorporate a lot of positive psychology um, principles in your work, and that's so aligned with what we do or what we learn here, what we try to promote at the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy. So thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You know, this is crazy, this world we're living in right now. And I I'm wake up every morning and I am um, surprised again, all over again, that what we um, what we take for granted is just not accessible in so many ways. And I'm finding in my practice that there's a tremendous buildup in stress. And so I imagine I can't be the only one. And so today I just kind of wanted to talk about what does that mean? What does that mean for us, this buildup in stress? And functional medicine, of course, I would assume challenges that or, or faces that on a constant basis. But, and you might also know that whenever we have a stress response, cortisol is produced by our brain and it generates this um, activity in our body that allows us to kind of fight or flight. That's normal. And normal levels of stress produce normal levels of cortisol, but there's nothing really normal about this. As a matter of fact, we don't just have one stressor. This isn't just a pandemic, right? There's all of the, the effects of the pandemic, the unemployment, the kids being at home, worried about people's health. And so those stressors continue to build and the amount of cortisol that's in our body continues to build. And so I think a big part of what I wanted to really address with you today is how to work with that stress, what to do about that stress. You know, when, the, when our stress elevates, the amount of self-care has to equally elevate. And yet so much of the, um, the ways that we self-care on a regular basis uh, aren't available. We can't go to the gym. We don't, we can't go out to eat. We can't necessarily get together with our friends. And so we have to really be creative and think outside the box a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Patty mentioned to me that everybody takes the um, VIA, Values and in Action Inventory, as a part of the program. And so I like to think that Many of those strengths that are identified in the VIA can be particularly helpful when it comes to addressing our self-care. Maybe first and foremost, and that is that of a very active gratitude practice. And I'm really interested if you want to throw into the comments whether or not you do that, or if you've found a particular gratitude practice that's that's very helpful. There's certainly, there's lots of apps for that. Just sitting around the dinner table and asking everybody, uh, can you name something really great about today is helpful and it gets the whole family involved in a gratitude practice. I like to think that the challenge with gratitude, because we're all, we're all able to say thankful, we're thankful for the nurses and the doctors and the delivery drivers and we see a lot of that right now. 
But I think that the real challenge um, for gratitude is to be grateful for the things that are hard. And I talk with people a lot about that because um, being grateful for the hard things doesn't really make sense in our brain. And I can remember many years ago, I actually did a continuing ed class at Penn um, about gratitude when some of that early research was coming out. And the speakers spent the whole day saying, be grateful for every single thing in your life. Well, I had been widowed at the age of 25 and I found it very challenging sitting there. That was the thing that just remunerated over and over in my brain. I'm not gonna say I'm grateful that my husband died. And I don't know that any of us can feel grateful that people are losing their jobs or that people are getting sick and family me members are losing loved ones. But as I went up to him at the break and talked to him about this, I said, you know, this is just not sitting well with me. And he said, fair, but can you be grateful for what you learned as a result of that experience? And to that, of course, I had to answer yes, because as the time went by, of course, I did great work um, with people who have lost loved ones. And I see somebody mentioned that the, um, the five minute journal has a great gratitude practice. And yes, it absolutely does. A lot of my clients use it. And there are a lot of um, great gratitude apps. There's also some really good um, gratitude blogs online, you name it. And if you just, you type in gratitude. When I first went to grad school, it wasn't really even anything more than a word in the dictionary. And today there's a million or 10 um, people that are, or I guess items on Google about that. Um, and so keep in mind that there's there's a lot of comments here about um, gratitude practice for in the morning, gratitude diaries. So if you don't have a gratitude practice, I want to strongly recommend that you adopt one. My challenge, you're welcome to follow me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page that's just, this is Leslin on Facebook, and I'm doing a gratitude challenge there. You're welcome to join me there. Um, I challenge myself not to duplicate anything every day. Although if I'm honest, I've duplicated wine and coffee once or twice, but uh, you'll notice that it forces you to just look for what's good in the world. And gratitude often leads to optimism, right? Which is the second character strength that I think is really important to foster during times of stress. And it's kind of, it leads to that idea that out of every bad thing can come something good. It doesn't help us um, if we just sit back and remunerate on the negative things. And you're absolutely right, Holly, optimism equals hope. Um, there's a lot to be hopeful for in the world. And we see people like the Texas Roadhouse CEO who's just donated his salary to his employees or um, the football player, uh, Breeze, Drew Breeze, that he and his wife just committed $5 million. Those things give you hope for humanity, at least they do for me. So finding a way to drive optimism and maybe even ask your families, what are you hopeful for? Uh, I think it's really important to create something that you can plan ahead for, right? If we make plans to have movie night with popcorn on Sunday, now everybody's looking forward to Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, and they're not so focused on what's happening just right here, right now, if that makes sense. The third attribute that I think is really helpful during stressful times is flow. And if you're unfamiliar with the concept of flow, it's that experience of losing track of time that happens when we're just really absorbed in what we love to do. Now, 
if for some reason you're not able to do what you love to do, maybe, um, maybe you are a, a runner and for some reason you can't get out and run, um, then it's going to be really important for you to shift gears and get creative to find something else that you like to do. My daughter, who has gotten laid off, said that she got on YouTube and started drawing apples. And she said, I just watched somebody pick up a charcoal pencil and a piece of paper, and they drew an apple, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do that. Said I didn't have an intention to, to learn how to draw. I was flipping through YouTube and saw this, and all of a sudden I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can. And before you knew it, she said I'd drawn like three apples that I'd spent four hours in front of the television on YouTube, which I thought was perfect because number one, she really dove into curiosity, which is another attribute. She experienced flow in that particular challenge, uh, which is very helpful when it comes to kind of centering to the present moment and eliminating stress. Of course, I uh, cannot talk about stress without talking about mindfulness. And I'm imagining that that's something that is very prominent in most of your minds. But if it isn't, I'll talk about mindfulness to the extent that I try to work with clients on. And the biggest misconception that I hear is that, oh, I tried that, it didn't work right that's the people have this misconception that mindfulness doesn't work and yet if you are skilled with mindfulness you know that it's probably the closest thing to a magic pill that any of us have which and let me know if you agree with that if you're practicing mindfulness because i'd like to know just a thumbs up if you have it um mindfulness allows us to connect to exactly what's happening right now, right here. And, and, and I think even if we were in the middle of something very chaotic, the ability to um, center in the present space is um, a blessing because it just takes us inside, right? And that's actually absolutely right. It just it brings you fully in the present moment. Um, the biggest mistake that people make is they expect mindfulness to be easy. And I saw that one of these things, one of the messages that popped up or comments was that it takes practice and you're absolutely right. My teacher told me it took him three years to have 20 minutes of pretty much nothing and so nothing really isn't the goal initially right nothing is something down here when you've really become experienced today the goal is just to learn how to bring your attention back to this thing i explain it often by helping people think about the peripheral vision test that you get when you go to the eye doctor and all of us have probably uh, experienced this. You're told to focus on a red light or a, a light, and then all these lights go on around you, and you're supposed to click when you see them. Can you relate? So mindfulness, I think, it's like that. We're supposed to be focusing on our breath or focusing on a candle or focusing on a, on a sound, and there's like, oh, what am I going to make for dinner? And what was that noise? Oh, crap, did I return that email? And there's all these other things going on. and Whatever that Disney movie is, uh, where you go, what, what, squirrel? You know, that's kind of what what it's like when you first start talking about mindfulness and knowing how to just bring your attention or keep your attention on this thing, regardless of what else is going on. Um, I like the suggestion from Lori about paying attention when you brush your teeth, and, and you're right when you pay attention because that's such a rote activity, right? When you pay attention, the experience of brushing your teeth can be a, a great way to develop a mindfulness practice. And I would recommend that anytime there's stress, you could go brush your teeth, 
uh, you might have, there's like two benefits to that, right? But if you don't want to brush your teeth 25 times a day, which is how many times my stress is elevating, um, just breathe. Just the experience of taking a deep breath, bringing your shoulders down on purpose, letting your whole body just kind of collapse into that space that you're in. The reason that this is super important is because, and I'm sure many of you understand, cortisol escalation can ruin our immune system. It has a very deliterous effect on our immune system. Uh, ultimately, cortisol, uh, excess cortisol over time can, uh, is a disease in and of itself, right? So it's really important that as that stress elevates, you make sure that you self-care so that the, the cortisol is coming down. If we don't pay attention to managing that level, then it's super important for you to realize that if my cortisol level goes here and I only self-care to here, then my baseline's down here. If I, I have to bring that all the way down, or the next time I get stressed, I'm adding on top of what's already there. Hopefully that makes sense to you. It, it'll be a slow, gradual buildup that you might not actually feel until you're not sleeping or until your immune system is weak or until you're grouchy and you've got all this fight in you because you haven't relaxed and calmed down. So try to make sure that uh, you pay attention. The reason that we're talking about this is so that those cortisol levels don't escalate. Uh, somebody suggested that they want to, or that they've been using the 20 seconds of hand washing to be mindful, which is another great idea. Really, anything that you um, are doing during the day, if you can remember to pay attention to that thing. I made risotto the other night and I'm stirring, and 30 minutes is a long time to be stirring to make risotto, but it was 30 minutes of just kind of watching the bubbles bubble and and paying attention to how it all thickens up. So anything that you do, you can turn into a mindful activity. Maybe last, but certainly not least, is the idea of incorporating some kind of spirituality into your stress reduction practice. And when I say spirituality, of course, I don't mean religiosity unless religion is important to you. It can be yoga, it can be a meditation, it can be a walk in nature, it can be hugging a tree, it can be sitting and um, practicing gratitude. Whatever your, the way that you connect to that thing that's outside of us, um, and when I say outside of us, certainly spirituality is inside, and so it's whatever metaphor works best for you, that thing that's bigger than us, is really what I was uh, attempting to say. One of the reasons that's important is because we don't know why bad things happen. And wanting to know why is one of those questions that drives us mad. Not knowing uh, what's gonna happen is probably the core element of stress, right? I don't know, especially for anybody who has anxiety um, or it has some elements of um, real uncertainty in their life right now, like they're, they've been laid off or somebody is, is sick and you don't want them to get worse. Those kind of challenges lead us to ask the questions, why? Why me? And so spirituality is incredibly helpful in those moments because we're really kind of saying, well, there's there's probably something else that's guiding whatever it is that the experience is. And I personally believe that everything happens for a reason. Now, whether that's to grow my soul, to grow my spirit, to guide someone, I, I have no idea. And I'm often fond of saying, I could be full of baloney, could be nothing. But believing that it's nothing doesn't help me in the least. And so I, 
find something to believe in. And I think that's really the center of what I mean by spirituality. This might be a good time to read some books, um, expand your horizon, or deepen your faith that, that already exists. So overall, those attributes that are taken from positive psychology are the key elements that we talked about gratitude, optimism, flow, mindfulness, spirituality. And when we employ those, we have to really kind of get outside of what we typically do. I mean, at the end of the day, this is forcing all of us to be creative. And, you know, we've, I heard about a surge at the office supply stores because we're having to be create space to work from home. We're trying to figure out, um, we're trying to figure out how to entertain our kids. You know, it's like summertime. This is gonna be the longest summer in the world, right? Those of you who have a hard time going like, where's when school start? I'm sorry to tell you, you got a few months in some cases. Um, and embracing challenges, thank you, and turning them into opportunities is a great attitude. And that's where, going back to gratitude, that's kind of the idea of thank you for this, right? What is the opportunity in this experience? What, how do I grow from this experience? Looking at every single event in your life that way will eliminate a lot of stress right stress is saying oh gosh i can't do this i don't know how to do this stress is um resistance and when you take that resistance away and you embrace it and you you accept and you allow it's amazing how much reduction in stress happens from that so i want to remind you to get outside now, for some of us, that's easier said than done, but if you have a backyard, you have a patio, um, you have a balcony, let the sun shine on your face. We know that sunlight helps our bodies produce vitamin D. Vitamin D is a feel good, and when you're getting it naturally from sunshine, that's helpful. Breathe. The breath is the body's equalizer. When we're stressed or afraid, we have a tendency to not breathe deeply. <clears throat> so oxygen doesn't circulate as well. We get more tired. Remember to breathe. Laugh. I cannot stress how helpful laughter is. You know, sometimes at funerals, we see people laughing. And it feels a little politically incorrect. And yet, laughter is so good for the soul. And sometimes it's hard to find something to laugh at. So I want to direct you straight to YouTube, where there are people doing some of the silliest, maybe insanely, I don't like the word stupid, so I won't use that, but whatever synonym is appropriate, um, but they're funny. And if some of you may remember the MTV show from years ago, um, where young adults did really ridiculous things. Today we can laugh at them. Um, laughter is good for your soul. Watching babies, watching my daughter, one of my daughters uh, created a TikTok this morning of my grandson, who is my new favorite person. Uh, he's almost three, but she created a TikTok from infancy to now. And um, I couldn't talk for the first 20 times I watched it because it was so special and it wasn't laughter but it was it fills you with joy right so laughter can fill you with joy find the joy wherever you wherever you can all right <clears throat> if you have any questions so far please go ahead and throw them up because i was going to mention briefly relationships uh have a particular challenge in these kinds of circumstances I met with clients last night that I've been working with for maybe six months, a married couple, and they talked about if, if they hadn't have been working together for six months on improving their relationship, this would have been impossible having for both of them to work from home with their five-year-old in the house all day. 
And I can only imagine across the world um, what that what must be happening for some people in some relationships. So I want to challenge you to remember that you're not the only one stressed, that your partner is stressed, your children are stressed. Um, and you might be noticing meltdowns over a paper cut. Uh, the paper cut is just a paper cut, but it's it also represents like a fissure in their um, in their strength and allowing all of that stress to kind of explode like an earthquake. So let the meltdowns over a paper cut happen because that's a relief valve and the energy has to come out. We might as well let it come out over a paper cup where you can just pick them up and hold them or reach over and give somebody a hug because that's kind of normal. Whether we want to admit it or not, the stress kind of sits there, even if we're not aware of it. Make sure that everybody gets some alone time. Um, it's really easy for us to say, hey, the whole world's going through this and we're pretty lucky, so suck it up. But we all need to feel what we're gonna feel, right? Um, Everybody needs alone time to process. Alone time is a great time to cry. Um, I'll talk about crying for just a moment. I don't know how much you guys work with the idea of emotional expression, but the crying is the body's way of releasing negative emotional toxins. There was a, a great study that came out. I don't know the author's name, but if I can find it, I'll make sure that it gets attached to this came out about a year and a half ago. And it was a study that looked at tears from people who were happy, people who were grieving, people who were in physical pain, and people who um, qualified as being depressed. And when they cried, the tears were collected and looked out under the microscope, and they were all different. Now, they weren't different because of the age or gender of the participants, they were different based on the type of tear. The reason that somebody was uh, crying, that's what made them different. And so that's, it's, it's really just a study that creates a lot of questions and a lot of hypothesis. Um, but it's really interesting and kind of proof for the fact that the human body is this perfectly designed machine that every little thing has a purpose and yet here we are as a culture telling our two and three and four year olds to sit down and shut up and suck it up and don't cry or i'll give you something to cry about we don't let that crying happen because we're feeling helpless so i would say we are all helpless to control the pandemic so let the tears flow and just comfort each other. Let it be a connection opportunity for you. Lastly, about relationships, I'm going to recommend more connection. Now, I've been telling my clients more skin to skin connection, which may or may not be sex, but more connection just with the people that you love. Hold your kids on your lap, cuddle with your partner. When we feel connected, we feel safe. And if you don't have a partner, make it a friend. Um, connect with a friend. We have extra time because we're, we're not commuting at the very least. So spend that time FaceTiming or Zooming with a friend. Join a meetup that has a coffee group or a wind down so that you're still having emotional connections. There is safety in numbers. And lastly, kids, I think I really covered the point that I wanted to make about, um, about children and the, the fissures or the, the things that they're stressed about. This is one of those things where they will incidentally be exposed and feel stress and not show it the way that you and I do. They'll show it by acting out. They'll show it by sleeping more if they're teenagers. 
they'll show it by ignoring you. Um, I, I recommend having some discussions. Do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? And then answering them age appropriately, but very honestly. It's a good time to help your kids practice acclimating to uncertainty. You know what, you guys, we don't know what's going to happen, but as long as we're together and we keep our heads, it's going to be okay. And that's the message. It's going to be okay. We don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be okay. Because humanity has persevered, right? We didn't necessarily like the way it ended, but it turned out to be okay because here we are. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I haven't really been looking. So Patty, if you see something that is a question, I'm happy, or if you have specific, um, and I will try to get that article on, on crying. I see there's a couple things there. Yeah, so Lois is asking, what could you suggest for students trying to focus on school at home? So my daughter's home from college and really grieving the loss that she feels and she's struggling to finish a paper seems like we need to allow for an adjustment time. So that's a really great point. Um, David Kessler um, had published an article the other day or somebody published an article with David Kessler who is one of the main authors or, or researchers on grief. And he said, in fact, for many people, this is a grief experience even though they haven't lost something. And Grief is, so I would like to challenge all of you to really reconsider the idea of grief because it's an all-encompassing emotional experience that is completely and totally unique to you or to each individual. And we know that grief is different. We, we account for that when we see members of the African community, African American community grieving, or members of the Italian American community grieving, or Asians. We, we see that difference, but we're not necessarily cognizant of it um, in our families. Uh, several years ago, my mom, and both of her parents, they all passed away within three months of each other. And my two aunts and my uncle, literally three people who lost half of their family, all had completely different grief reactions. And they didn't understand each other at all. As a matter of fact, they were quite judgy about the reactions that they had because grief is, is dependent on the relationships, the loss, the attachment each individual has to that particular thing. And for one college student, they might be relieved to be home. And another one says, man, that's where my life was. Like for, for some people, I can imagine that they felt like they lost their entire ability to be, to have a life. It probably doesn't sound good to mom, but you know, certainly if you're 20 years old and you're in your social life and your future is connected to college, that can be challenging. So one, honor the grief. Ask, talk to her about processing. Um, accept that that's where she is. And I would encourage five minutes of focus. In other words, I have this, somehow I inadvertently kind of made this up. I thought it was I really thought I was talking about Mel Robbins's rule, her, her um, maybe I think it's a five minute rule, but, but I must have misinterpreted it years ago. And I created this five minute rule of anytime I want to start something and I just can't seem to bring myself to do it, I give myself five minutes. So I set a timer and I dive into it and I just commit for five minutes. Now, at the end of five minutes, if I still really not into it, I stop. More often than not, I only have a few minutes left or now I'm in the groove and it's easy for me to keep going. So I would certainly offer that um, as a, as a um, antidote, if you will, 
to the college student or anybody who's struggling to find some motivation. Try, five, try the five minute rule. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a good question. I know I've heard um, people in the news talk about this um, as an issue. So um, I think it's good that we address this here today. So what would you suggest for people who are in toxic relationships and now with everybody at home spending more time um, together? Um, this is obviously a challenging time for them. Yeah, that's a really great question. <clears throat> so first and foremost, if you feel unsafe, of course, I have to suggest that you leave the environment. Um, again, that's challenging to do, but your safety is, is the first priority. If it's, if, if it's not so, diff so difficult that you have to leave, or if you don't feel physically safe, then I'm going to say boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Um, and if you need any help with um, learning boundaries, there's a great book by Henry Cloud. I think it's called Boundaries. Now, he writes it from a biblical perspective. If that applies to you, great. If it doesn't, just read over that part because there's some really, really good information in that book about setting boundaries. And, and a boundary is really a, a fence that you put up to say, here's the limit. I'm, I would say that you probably have to find some space in your home that separates you, even if that space is some headphones and some music or a movie or white noise, doesn't have to be talking because certainly we get tired of that constantly. Um, it, depending on how small the space is, toxic relation, you can ask the other person to leave. Um, you know, depending on your situation, I mean, I, I would be tempted to go rent a KOA cabin if that's what it meant for me to feel like I was physically and emotionally safe. But again, I'm going to suggest that you get creative. You must understand what boundaries are. Again, there's a plethora of information available on the internet about setting boundaries. Henry Cloud's book is, is one of the best resources. Um, also, the, um, hmm, the name of the book is escaping me at the moment. Oh, uh, Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. It's really written from the, um, well, let me say, I'll, I would recommend the new codependency. She wrote Codependent No More back in the late 70s. Uh, the new codependency was written, I think, around 2006, 2010. So it's a more updated version, uh, but still the same information. And if you take out the addiction elements, unless that applies to you, of course. So if there's addiction in your life anywhere, read the new codependency. That talks also a lot about setting boundaries. Um, if it's not addiction, then I would go to Henry Cloud, unless you just can't really do the biblical thing which case you can go back to the new codependency. And hopefully that helps. I mean, but remember, your safety is first and foremost. That's great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so Roberta is asking you to name those books again. Yes, okay, so, so there's two by Melody Beattie. One is, the old one is Codependent No More. Her new one is The New Codependency by Melody Beattie. And the other one I mentioned that's more biblically oriented is Boundaries by Henry Cloud. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, so make sure, you know, we still have some time left if there's any questions. Um, Leslie, you had talked about uh, and brought up that feeling of helplessness. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and in, situ in the situation and how we can pivot away from, from that. That's a really good question. So helplessness is that feeling that we have. Many of us do not recognize it, but it's the feeling we have when we can't change something. 
So I, I find that people in the helping field, a lot of people who are either coaches or therapists or doctors or nurses, um, we all like to fix. And when we can't fix, the feeling that's often generated is helplessness. And helplessness comes out in frustration, anger, uh, control issues. Most control issues are, are a result of the need to create safety, which often happens when we feel helpless. And so remember that we all control ourselves only. The only thing that we have control over is us, which means our response to a particular situation. So this could go back to the whole question about what do you do with a to in a toxic relationship? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand that you're not going to change that person. You're not, if you can't change your situation, then you're probably going to feel pretty helpless to get out or to have any kind of a positive effect. But you absolutely can change your reaction. And I talk a lot about um, the idea of detachment. And the metaphor that I often use is the idea of rain. And so let's say that it's, it's going to be raining all weekend, which in Delaware it's going to be. Um, but if I'm a party planner and I have 80 people coming to a party, I'm, I'm going to be relatively devastated by that rain. All of the emotions that I have are coming from me about the rain. And we know that, we know it's not the rain. It, we know that that emotion is getting generated from me because the, um, the farmer across the street from me sees the forecast for the rain and he's elated because he just planted all of his crops. So he's happy about the rain. The rain is just the rain. It's my meaning about the rain that drives the emotion that I feel. I hope I'm going to say that one more time. It's the meaning that I attach to something that drives the emotion that I have about that thing. And that's really important to understand. And so if we feel helpless, on one hand, we have to sit back and we need to go look at what meaning have I attached to this thing that I feel helpless about. And that's, I mean, this is a great time to do some of that soul searching, right? Emotions are driven from inside of us. One might argue that there's just love and fear. All good emotions are based in love. All uh, bad emotions are rooted in fear. Most of us will have fear about the unknown. And that's hardwired into our brain. Because thousands of years ago, if you saw a big gray outcropping of something out on the savanna, and you weren't afraid if you just made the lackadaisical assumption that that was rock and you charged out there, but it was actually a bunch of elephants, your life could be in danger. And so the people that survived, obviously, were the people that said, ooh, I, maybe I need to be afraid of that. And they took some caution. So fear became hardwired. We all, almost always, go right to some fear space because that's our survival. Our brain does that automatically. And if we're afraid and we don't have a solution, we feel helpless. We feel helpless to affect or to change the problem, right? To fix it. We feel helpless to fix it. Now, some people don't have an issue with that. They're like, well, I can't do anything about it. No, I'm not going to worry about it. But most fixers aren't that way. Most fixers are like, oh, there's got to be a solution and they'll be up all night or they'll be researching. And so first of all, identify that that's what it is. Understand that 
that's where you go. I'm a big believer that information is power. So I probably should talk about this. Information is power, but we can over inform. You know that you're over informed when your stress level is rising. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not already proficient in understanding the stress response in your own body, become proficient. That's something you have control over. You're not going to feel helpless if you start really understanding where you have control and what you can do about that. So it's kind of like a pulling in, right? If I feel helpless about all these things back here, and I start investigating what do I have control over, that sense of helplessness starts to dissipate. I, when you had just said over information, um, that point, I feel like that's just not applicable to this um, period in our lives. But I don't know, for coaches, for you, I think I immediately thought of, wow, you know, we come out of FMCA with a ton of information and sometimes we're so excited to share it and um, regardless of what situation because again you know wanting to to help a person um, that uh, we can over that 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 might be if we're not using our really good coaching skills and listening that we might want to over inform people so um, thanks for that kind of prompt um, mm -hmm. Yeah, someone just said information does not equal wisdom. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we talked about some, some different strategies um, through our um, character strengths that we can use at this time. And we also um, briefly talked about some imagery that yes. we could also use. And I was wondering, you could talk a little bit about that, but I'm wondering if you could give us imagery for, you know, uncertain times, because that's what these are, um, that we can maybe use and internalize and perhaps share with other people um, for, you know, this last little bit. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's a technique that if you again if you get good at it, it can be instant my daughter just called before this call and she was experiencing some frustration and she was on the verge of tears and she goes mom i just need you to help me real quick i need a waterfall give me a waterfall mom and so i just walked her through this because that's one of her favorite things and i just walked her through this little guided imagery of going to a space and i think we all probably can sit back and Think of a time when we felt very much at peace. For me, I was, I was sitting on the steps at the Riverwalk in San Antonio. It was April. It was warm. There's like a courtyard where the Marriott and the mall all meet. And I've only been there once, so I, I think I'm describing this right. There was a guy across the way that was playing pan flute. And... The canoes were coming in and the boats were coming in and turning around. So the water was lapping against the um, concrete steps just ever so lightly. And I remember closing my eyes and absorbing the experience of that moment because it just, it, it was just, it, it, it was like a perfect alignment of all the things that I really love music, water, sunlight. And when I'm stressed, Often I will imagine myself there in that space. And that's again about closing your eyes and imagining or using the imagery of that amazing moment to calm yourself. Now, if you can't do that on your own, again, I'm going to send you to YouTube. There are a million and one guided imagery, uh, short meditations, five minutes is really all you need. And allowing somebody else to kind of take you on this visual experiential journey that your brain will absolutely manifest for you, um, do that. Another thing I do is I use Pinterest and I have a Pinterest board of beaches that I want to sit on. And I, you know, just scoured the internet and clicked a picture of a beach that looked pristine and isolated and calming and I added it to a Pinterest board. And so now I can go there and 
take myself away. So hopefully understanding how to use that kind of imagery. Um, take yourself away. It's kind of like a Calgon experience. But uh, for those of you young and old enough to know what I mean by that, it's a Calgon experience in your mind. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have, okay, your turn, audience's turn, if there's anything else that um, is coming up for you right now that you wanted to talk about or share, maybe some strategies that you're using or just, you know, to say, okay, you know, yeah, I'm just kind of sitting in some, some maybe negative emotions right now. Um, so yeah. So Lori knows what you mean by the Calgon experience. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, so one question yeah. somebody asking guided imagery is okay to use with people who can be oh. experiencing PTSD. I do believe so as long as you're not, to, I would get, I would make sure that I stay away from anything that might have some similarities. Um, you know, for example, somebody who landed on the beach at D-Day, I wouldn't take them to a beach. I'd help, I'd find out from them what would be peaceful. Um, and I know that's kind of a, a stark example, but often like in hypnosis, if I'm going to do a progressive relaxation, progressive relaxation with somebody in hypnosis, I'm going to ask them what they relate to. And, and sometimes I might ask, can you describe for me a moment in your life when you felt joy? And if they're telling you about this experience, then you can create something around that for the imagery. I think that they'd be very relatable. Um, so what suggestion would you give a coach to guide and how to tell when I should refer someone to a counselor? So, Any time that behavior or feelings are impacting the quality of the life or the quality of the relationship in your life, that's when you see a counselor. I think it's a pretty simple um, guide, uh, rule of thumb. Any time the quality of your life or the quality of your relationships are failing to to reach the pinnacle that you want them to, uh, that's a good time to get help from a psychologist or a counselor. And then with boundaries, if you implement those and people get mad at you because you say no, is that the question? Um, it's an anonymous attendee. So if you could just kind of type that. If, if people get mad at you because you say no, um, you need to read code the new codependency. No is your boundary. And people are going to get mad at you if you say no. Because people are asking because they want something. But how many of us get everything we want, right? I mean, that's just a simple fact. Saying no is... Um, saying no is saying I'm important too. So try to remember that. And, and it is perfectly okay for people to get mad at us. Now, nobody likes that, right? We, especially if you're a fixer, you're probably a little bit of a people pleaser. We don't like that. But at the end of the day, if I'd never said no to anybody, how do I respect or honor myself? So the, the short answer is absolutely. Implement boundaries, even though people are going to get mad at you. Now, I want to say this, and I meant to say this about relationships. The way we say no is important. <laughs> and the way that we talk um, or that we talk to one another in these relationships and during this time is super important. And without specifically plugging my podcast, as a therapist, I talk a lot about relationships and I do have seven podcasts that are specifically related to communication. Everything that, um, that I teach about communication is highlighted in those podcasts, uh, which is 
pretty much the outline for my next book, but the, it's imperative if you're going to say no, not to say it. The podcast is called Try This at Home. And it's on Spotify, uh, iTunes, um, Google Play, and it's on the web, try this at home podcast.com. Um, and there's no charge for that. So we can't just say hell no when somebody asks us something. That's not good communication. What we need to say is, um, I don't think that's going to work for me, or I can't, or maybe it's just I don't want to right now. Um, but the books, the books that I talked about and that we linked up here, um, will definitely help you with that. And then, yes, yeah, so I need some quick, simple distress, de-stressors that would be helpful for ER nurses and doctors that you can do while working. So far, I've got four, seven, eight breathing gratitude, other ideas that the imagery I think would be really helpful. I mean, at the very least, when you take a bathroom break and you sit down, imagine yourself, you know, if you can turn on the faucet first, just to kind of take yourself out of that. What, running water is often very helpful for people and it makes it easier to think that you're sitting next to a waterfall uh, it'll make it easier to pee too. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, so I have an, one um, from Kimberly. So she's struggling with overwhelm. How do you take action and not feel stuck? Well, so this is easier said than done, like almost everything I say. <laughs> um, you have to break it apart. No one, no one can sit down to a Thanksgiving dinner by themselves. Nobody can eat an elephant. And that's the old saying, right? Um, the, anytime you feel overwhelmed, the solution is to pull it apart. And I, I can't make it more simple than that. And, you know, because I'm not actually giving anybody individual uh, counseling advice, we have to look at this very generically. What are the pieces, if you're feeling overwhelmed, step one, what are the pieces about this situation that are actually mine to control? Everything else has to go over here. And if it's helpful, write everything down on a little piece of paper and physically move the things that you do not have any control over to the side. Sometimes the brain makes a really good connection when we create a physical component. The things that you do have control over, organize those in, in terms of priority. And the, th the things being the most important, the ones that you want to tackle right away. I have a friend who just got out of the hospital and I was talking to her yesterday and I said, so how are you feeling? She goes, I'm exhausted. What did you eat? Well, I haven't eaten yet today. Why not? That's, that's got to be your priority. She said, well, I just didn't have enough energy to cook something. I said, what have you been doing? She said, well, I had to do some laundry and I had to do the dishes and I had to feed the cats. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what you have to do is put 100% of your energy into the things that are going to make a difference right now in the short term. So I'm using that just as an example of when you feel overwhelmed, pull it apart. Okay. That's great. That was great advice. You, this was a wonderful call. Um, so many great tips. So timely for um, this current period of time, but everything that we talked about today can be applicable to so many other times in our life as well. So um, I'm really grateful for you today and for your, this conversation and for everybody who could join in and participate. Um, you know, we're all in this together. That's what we want to convey um, that this is our community and we're there for each other. So please reach out um, again, if you guys need anything and thank you so much, Leslin, for being here with us today. My pleasure. Yep.
All right, everybody take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.